finally, a source of raw, real, and honest information on healthcare issues that matter most. Welcome to BS Free MD. From the latest medical information to how to stay sane as a doctor or a patient, no subject is taboo, no BS is allowed. Now, let's welcome your hosts, Doctors May and Tim Heinmarsh. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of BS Free MD. And today uh, we have a very special guest joining us. It's Dr. Roger McFillin. Dr. McFillin is a clinical psychologist, writer, speaker, and the host of the Radically Genuine podcast. He's also the executive director of the Center for Integrated Behavioral Health in Bethlehem, uh, Pennsylvania. Over his two decade career, Dr. McFillin has become disillusioned with the American mental health care system, and he's now on a mission to expose the harm caused by psychiatric diagnosis and drugs, um, challenging the messages that keep us and you sick and dependent and using science to back it up. So um, let's just get into the show. Welcome, Dr. McFillin. Thanks for joining us. And we're happy to have you here today to have a great discussion on this. <laughs> it's an honor to be both with both of you. Thanks for having me. You bet. So let's start at the beginning. Um, we spoke briefly before we hit record about kind of the journeys that we've taken from sort of the darkness to the light. Can you kind of tell us of, you know, what happened with you? How did you kind of change your mind from the standard narrative of you have a chemical imbalance, you need a pill to, you know, where you are now? Sure. I mean, it's been a long journey for me. When I first started in this system, I was a 22 year old man working in a children's psychiatric hospital. And I really knew nothing about mental health at that period of time. I thought I was going to be in education, maybe be a college football coach. So I was still trying to find myself. And I worked in a children's psychiatric hospital ages five to 10. So these were kids that were very young who were presenting with emotional and behavioral problems. Some of them acting out violently, some of them even suicidal. And you can imagine the backgrounds many of these kids came from. Very abusive and violent backgrounds. They had clear post-traumatic stress reactions. I mean, you'd see it when you'd meet them. They were so guarded and hypervigilant. And my exposure to what was child psychiatry at that time was absolutely appalling. You know, what I observed simply was this. It was the mass drugging of kids to try to tranquilize them into behavioral compliance. And I was exposed to the pseudoscientific nature of the entire system. You know, I recall distinctly a psychiatric evaluation with a child, which I was often present for, existed of just a few questions. What's your name? How old are you? And why are you in the hospital? The third one, most kids could really not answer at all. And then I would see a write-up of a psychiatric evaluation assigning severe mental illness diagnoses, usually multiple, to this kid after just getting some background information on admission from uh, an adult that's usually not that reliable. And so you'd have uh, the typical diagnoses that I would see where ranged from childhood bipolar disorder, major depressive disorder, uh, ADHD, oppositional defiant disorder. And stabilization was being on multiple mood and mind altering drugs, which I later learned were not approved for kids that age, were not evaluated or studied for any long-term consequences. So what did I see? I saw the deterioration of, of a lot of kids. I think the best that we got was a, a version of a kid that was sedated. The worst that I saw was akathisia, sleeping for 16 to 18 hours of the day, acting out even more violently, uh, a number of side effects from the drugs like tardive dyskinesia. So that was my initial experience into the system. So right there, I knew it was, it was bullshit and it was a way to try to drug compliance. So my next step was I had to leave that system and I actually entered into juvenile uh, justice system. I was a juvenile probation officer for a, a few years. I went and got a master's degree in uh, school counseling. I was going to try to stay in education. Witnessed the same thing in juvenile probation. I worked on a specialized unit of kids with, who, had, who obtained a mental health diagnosis but also committed crimes. And again, nonsense about what the diagnosis would be. They'd often um, very haphazardly assign all these labels based on very little evidence. So I'd work with a caseload of kids who, again, were prescribed these 
the, these drugs under these the disguise of the scientific legitimacy of things like childhood bipolar disorder or ADHD or just some general mood disorder as a way as if there was some explanation for you know some of the juvenile delinquency behaviors that we were observing and so i was able to go into the homes of where these kids were coming from you know often the parents were drug addicts um they were in gangs they lived in poverty it didn't matter whether they go, went to school or didn't go to school and so what are you going to see you're going to see them kind of model the same behaviors that were modeled for them and you know it's just a the, I found that the entire, uh, you know, way that we thought about mental health was built on kind of a bedrock of lies that was heavily influenced by this growing biomedical model at the time. This is, you know, 90s into early 2000s where they're trying to identify mental illness as a, as a brain disorder. So you probably hear the chemical imbalance and, you know, this is like, you know, even moral behaviors or behavioral problems are... Uh, imbalances of key neurochemicals and you know we can treat these like insulin for diabetes and then just what's occurred over i think the past few decades is just uh, the normal reactions of day-to-day -day living are being pathologized and my major problem with where the field has gone is it's just a it's just an arm of the pharmaceutical companies and you know they're creating more customers through this pseudoscientific nonsense. I knew that I had to go and continue with my education to become a psychologist. So I knew before I stepped one day into my doctoral program that uh, my experience in the system led me to believe that it's creating much more harm than it is helping people. And this is in generations where there's so much mass media that's produced that uh, you know pushes mental health. There's this over fragilizing of like every human being. I was also working in schools. I was working in various clinics and, you know, it's just very quick identification of these disorders in a similar way that we apply other diagnoses. Uh, but, you know, without the same science background, right? There's no observable uh, brain condition. We don't test for chemical imbalances. So you just see that it's, um, it's, mislabeling of a lot of normal human actions and behaviors that I think have that are functional and adaptive and have we've really adapted over you know hundreds and thousands of years to be able to that our, our emotions are very extremely valuable and uh, when when someone experiences anxiety or you know depressed mood or a kid is struggling to focus you know there's legitimate reasons for that and those DSM diagnoses they have no explanatory value and so I, I think those that those background and work that I did before I even became a psychologist in, in, informed me that the system was doing much more harm. And then, boy, then there's the last, you know, 15 years of my career as a clinical psychologist. Well, you know, a couple of things come to mind, and uh, I've referenced this on several of our shows. We interviewed uh, Theron Fleury, uh, Stanley Cup winning hockey player who was raped by his junior hockey coach something like 130 times. And he really, it really hit me when we spoke with him about how, you know, it's trauma and the difference, you know, just because a traumatic event can produce a psychological or psychiatric diagnosis, it doesn't mean you treat trauma the way you would treat somebody who you know, spontaneously becomes a schizophrenic. It, it, you know, they're, they're different things. And we make everything mental illness and everything a, a plug and play. You know, we worship at the altar of scientism and probably the unholy Bible of scientism is the DM, DM, DSM-4. I mean, th this, there's stuff that goes in and out of there depending on style. You know, transgenderism used to be a mental health diagnosis. Homosexuality used to be a mental health diagnosis. It just now it's now it's something that you, you know, you get medications for to change your gender because there's no such thing as male and female. I mean, it just becomes so absurdly insane so quickly that it's it's I mean, I, I love when we hear these kind of conversations because we're taking normal things like you're supposed to be anxious when you're a teenager. You're awkward. That's what anxiety was made for. If you're traumatized and raped 130 times, that's probably going to mess you up. And you're probably going to have to unpack that over years to figure out how to heal from it. But somehow we throw pills at it because it's a marketing scheme. 
Yeah, no doubt. And it goes way beyond that. I mean, you just described a, a situation, a victim of abuse or rape. And obviously those are, those are horrible events, but we're drugging normal right now. I mean, any person that goes into their primary care doctor, they're going to be administered this nonsense um, depression screener that was, um, which was developed by Pfizer. And if you ever go, if you ever read the, um, if you ever, if you ever read this depression screener that they're, they're using, the name escapes me right now. Um, but you know, it's very clear to me that you can now over identify almost anybody with experiencing depression through that screener. And that's a very bold and, um, it's really bold initiative by the medical establishment to be, to get into screening for for mental health, and I think that's the alignment with the the pharmaceutical agencies uh, and the pharmaceutical industries is that you're going to increase your 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 customer base. And if you just use psychiatric drugs on the extremely small and rare uh, patient populations that they may have an effect for, so I, I look at a lot of them as the potential for emergency medicine, short term, severe episodes. You know, somebody is extremely manic or psychotic. You know, these are drugs that they're they're identified as like antipsychotic or mood stabilizing, but they're really repackaged tranquilizers. And so there might be some short term value for some of these drugs in a small percentage of people, but generally the overwhelming amount of people are going to be harmed by these drugs. They don't have they don't have the benefits. They're very they're exaggerated benefits off of short term clinical trials. The harms are kept hidden. Um, there's widespread corruption. The pharmaceutical industry, it, generally speaking, is the most lucrative criminal organization in the history of the world. And the more you dig into this, and this is going into my career now a little bit, is when I entered into my doctoral program, I decided to actually examine the literature. And I have kind of the past 15 years. And it's really like a, a, a dark web of... Um, misrepresentation of scientific data, um, horrible constructed studies, um, conclusions that are not based on the actual data, the pharmaceutical companies basically rigging the studies to create some statistical difference, and then only publishing the results of studies that served their drug and file drawing the rest of it. And when you're mass drugging, when you're mass prescribing these drugs to young people and they're not told of the adverse consequences, the potentially fatal ones, the more than double risk of a suicide event, uh, the potential for psychosis, mania, permanent sexual dysfunction, you're not only violating the law, but you're violating the ethics of your profession. And this is, I'm speaking directly to the prescribers, right? Because for a long time, you know, I, I've said, well, the prescribers, they themselves, they are not provided this information. And so they can't be held liable. They can't be held accountable because it's the major medical organizations and it's the textbooks and the way that they're trained, that they're told that they have to do these things. But I've gone beyond that in my career because here I am, you know, a clinical psychologist. I did the work myself. I don't even prescribe these drugs, but I have a responsibility to inform my patients and Physicians have an ethical and legal responsibility towards informed consent. So you have to stay educated on the adverse consequences of these drugs. You have to be aware of how they were brought to market. You have to be aware of the minimal efficacy of, of these drugs and how we have no evidence that most of them are going to outperform placebo, speaking of like the antidepressant drugs and drugs that we call, you know, anti-anxiety drugs or the same combination of drugs that we're going to uh, experiment on developing brains with to multiple uh, identifiable conditions that are, are really just these uh, created diagnoses where like we, in the pharmaceutical industry, they kind of create diseases for their drugs to work for. And so I, I don't want to take the doctors off the hook here because you have such a, a professional responsibility to informing our, our clients and our, and our patients. And, and that's the major problem I have right now in our culture is people do not receive informed consent. And you dig deep into, you know, how these drugs came to market and all you're going to find is corruption and fraud. I, I have to jump in. I have so many questions on a couple of different things, but right to now what you're speaking really hit home um, to me. And I hope 
all of our medical physician yes. prescribing yes. audience that's listening because what you're saying and this totally makes sense but you know i've never really wrapped my head around it like this and i don't think anybody does is that if we as a family doc or internal medicine primary care physician see somebody and they come in and they're like we give them a cardiac drug because it's like, oh well i think their heart's beating irregularly and i think they probably need digoxin yada yada pick this medication but i don't look at all the risk factors based on all their other health stuff. I don't interpret the information and the data right on their labs and their physical exam. And I just throw this digoxin at them and don't even really check levels regularly. I'm a whole world of shit because I've really just poisoned this person with this very dangerous yes. drug. Yes, you have. And I know that and would really, you know, in all our training and anyone listening would go, well, yeah, that makes sense. Same with the like, pick a... If I give you insulin, but you really don't have diabetes, blah, blah, blah. But when it comes to psychiatric drugs, we just willy nilly go, eh, they're acting this way. They sound depressed. Are they really? Or is it a life event? Or what's really going on? Or what really happened? And so it's so easy and mind numbingly uh, haphazard and irresponsible, but it happens every day, all the time. And I don't know why we can't correlate the two as being the same thing. And having the same, uh, I won't say responsibility, but I, yeah, we I should, mean, but it gets, it should. gets, I mean, it, it's just like, it gets worse. Dr. McPhillan brought up the whole, the whole, whether it's the ham D or whatever the, the, uh, screening test is Th those screening metrics did not come out of medicine. They came out of government. Yeah. They came, they came out of the, the whole metric mill that is the, actually predates Obamacare. It's the stimulus package where you get paid based on how many metrics you meet. One of the metrics and one of the easiest ones is the depression screening. And so, you know, spousal abuse, depression screening, blood pressure, and, uh, you know, how many beers do you drink? And, and you know, oh. it, it drives patients crazy, but this is how primary care doctors get paid. If you meet those metrics, there is tons and tons more money for you at the end of the year. It is a direct kickback through the government via insurance companies to providers to do those screening tests. But all it takes is any one of us that's a doctor to be a patient, be on the other side yes. of things. And you realize how foolish these things are. I mean, every time I go, I'm it's going righteous. to the ortho. Ortho I say, no, I'm I never the drink. Even though I have a tea, I, even though I have a show called Doc Tales of Cocktails, <laughs> I never drink. I just, it's called a righteous lie. Well, I've been at the. No, ortho there's no Jews in my attic. <laughs> when, the, when the Gestapo comes. But I was gonna say I've been at the orthopedist like more times than anyone, mostly in their lifetime, the last few years, and I get so mad because I'm going to get my hip checked. For instance, the first question is, outside of okay, I've checked in, put my name and birth date, is a depression screening question. It's not which hip, which joint are you here for? How long have you had pain? It's not getting to that. It's the depression question that pops up first. From an orthopedist. And and I get so mad now. I'm like, oh, I look at this thing. And you're right. I think of my life from the past week or last past week, month, whatever. I'm like, everybody will be have freaking anxiety, depression, or a mental health diagnosis based on how my week went. Uh, because it's so vague and it just captures a moment in time that might have nothing to do with really what's going on. And so it's use it's a frustrating because I know how terrible it is. It is a screen questionnaire, but I'm like, what is the orthopedist going to do with this? Well, I know they're going to get paid. Do they really care if I'm depressed? Um, are they going to just send me, you know what I mean? So it's, it's terrible. It's a terrible thing, a tool, and it's really harmful. And I think most patients can hopefully see through that. Um, but as clinicians, I think we're just doing a shitty job at being honest about that. Let me ask you a question. What is the benefit for the insurance company to act under these regulations? So why would the insurance company pay more if they do these things? Because it, it doesn't, it certainly doesn't represent an evidence-based model. And it's actually in, in increasing the amount of people who are going to turn to 
to healthcare. So that seems like it's going to increase the cost for the insurance company. No, it's, oh, but they flip it around. No, it's, it's, it's a direct, these... it's a direct, it's a direct path through from the federal government. Yeah. So how it works is the federal government sets the metrics. The insurance company is the administrator of the dollars and they get way more money from the federal government if the metrics are hit. So it's a trickle down from the feds to the insurance companies, which sort of police us to us personally. And so everyone has skin in the game, but it's all coming, you know, basically from Leviathan from the federal government. Uh, It doesn't, it's not rational. It's just the way it is. This is to the point where Optum, so Optum is the um, healthcare service arm of United Healthcare, which is the biggest for-profit healthcare entity in the world. It does about 380 billion a year. Okay. So, Optum goes out, has bought up practices. And when you talk to the Optum guys, they're actually pretty pretty honest about it. Like I've actually talked to one of their acquisitions guys. And he's like, we we, we, we want nothing to do with hospitals. Zero. Hospitals are losers. They're going to lose this money. What they want is gigantic numbers of covered lives so they can run metric mills where they can tick all these boxes off. I mean... we're paying fam- they're paying some family doctors over 400 grand a year because they're so good at ticking these damn boxes. Jeez. Hmm, so in in my field in the psychiatric industrial complex which I call it over 80% of these drugs are prescribed in primary care settings. So you're talking about pediatrics, family medicine, and that's where that's what's led to the dramatic increase in use of psychiatric drugs. It's, it's close to a quarter of uh, all Americans, adults right now are on some psychiatric drugs. And it just increases by every year, despite more and more information that shows that it's a scam and they create real harm. And so I don't even really know how to, it's like an uphill battle that I'm swimming. I don't even know how to get through it because so many people like myself are speaking out of against it, but I might be in this limited algorithm where most people aren't exposed to it. And so I'm, I'm getting people coming into my practice in the past, I don't know, maybe a small percentage of people would be trying an antidepressant, possibly. It's at this point, it's it's rare for me to meet somebody who's not on multiple psychiatric drugs. Yep. Never evaluated, not ever studied, not in combination with each other, and often prescribed off label for conditions, you know, that yep. can range from, you know, irritable bowel syndrome to, you know, all the other psychiatric diagnoses, right? It's just like mass prescribed to to people outside of any bounds of safety or efficacy. And other than me getting on the phone and talking to the doc and say, basically, what are you doing? Like, we have to restore this person's health. I need to get them the baseline. Um, you know, I don't, I don't really have any other recourse. And there's a lot of people who will come see me and they're not going to go against their doctor, even though 99% of the doctors I'm talking to don't even have one percent of the information I have because I've right. dedicated my career to understanding this. But since they are licensed to prescribe it, they're seen as as the expert, but they have no expertise. And what I'm just trying to do is get people to stop repeating lies over and over again. You keep repeating lies over and over again, it becomes collective truth. So you start saying things like you need to be on this drug for at least a year. It's correcting a chemical imbalance. You're stable now. They're misrepresenting withdrawal symptoms as as if it's a returning mental illness because they have no idea that the drug creates dependency. I'm seeing putting teenagers on benzodiazepines for sleep problems. It's absolutely out of control and insane to such an extent that I don't know how I can continue to function working in the system the way that it is. It's only a matter of time before they come after my license. I mean, I, I realize that because you're brainwashed as a, as a psychologist or a mental health clinician throughout your training, you're told you have to act within the boundaries of your competence. You have to continue to refer to uh, physicians. You're taught the same nonsense about chemical imbalances. Mm -hmm. And there is a culture of fear that exists in in the mental health field that clinicians are now working with people from a fear-based model. They're afraid of their emotions. They're afraid of suicide. They're afraid of self-harm. They're afraid of any reaction. They're afraid of losing their license, malpractice suits. It's a constant culture of fear and that you work in that fear, fear fear-based model. And so what you do is you continue to cultivate fear. Most of people, what are they struggling with is fear to some extent. It's going to be on the spectrum of fear. 
It could be intense worry that creates anxiety that could lead them to overeat, to abuse substances, to self-injure, to think about suicide. But it's on the spectrum of fear and you live a certain way and uh, a certain amount of time in fear that can really manifest itself into real legitimate mood problems. So we have this really unhealthy population that has a poor diet, more socially isolated than ever before. You know, some one could even say that a lot of the food that we're eating is 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 poison. Mm -hmm. You know, with yeah. with um, yeah. I mean, I can't even go to a restaurant without it being cooked in industrial based seed oils. You know, you eat at a you eat at a restaurant. Someone like me who has a healthy diet, you know, my joints hurt for the next two or three days. I have to recover from that process. Right, so we're being mass poisoned. We're conditioned by fear. We're divided as a nation. People are really scared. They know something's right around the corner, right? Like, look what's going on globally. Look what's going on in the United States, right? Everyone knows something's right around the corner. The borders are, are wide open. Uh, we just got out of the, pa the pandemic. We know it was a bioweapon that was released on the world, right? Everyone knows it coming, so you're in fear. And you're in fear. You're in a state of fear. And this is taking away any legitimate problems that you might have in your life, right? People die. People get sick. There's trauma, um, you have loss of job, your kids might be struggling. You go into your doctor and they write you a prescription, another toxic drug um, on top of all the other toxicity. And trying to dig your way out of that as, a, as an ethical clinical psychologist, trying to help people restore their mental well being and their physical well being, it feels like a completely impossible task because you're going against what is conventional and standard healthcare practices. Yeah, I, I, I'm think, you know, I'm listening to <laughs> yeah. all this and I'm still thinking back to the very beginning about the children in the hospital and no one's asking the questions about, you know, like you walk into do a home. Uh, we, we used to do house calls. You do a home visit and you see the conditions that they're living in. And you're like, well, no wonder this kid is in the fetal position, catatonic and not speaking because of the trauma, whatever abuse happened, you know, the, the what's happened or uh, how they've grown up. No one's asking the questions and it's just like, oh, look at them, to throw, throw a pill at them. Um, so looking at society and, you know, I hear your frustration. It is just so overwhelming. I think back to, oh, yeah, we talked about this, our grandparents' generation <laughs> that lived through the Spanish flu, World War I, II, a Boer War, whatever, depression, no money, no food. They're, they weren't going to the doctor and getting pills for the for this stuff. And there was always, there was the fear, the uncertainty, that mentality. What did they do differently? Like it, it wasn't. Well, they, they did uh, several things differently. They got out in the sun, they exercised, they ate real food. They had unbelievably tight knit relationships. Cause if you didn't, you all died. Like my grandparents came from um, Eastern Europe. Right. But it and was a life is hard. You they, had s social support systems. Right. It's the uh, way humans saying, are made I'm not to saying live. just get over it, but what is your thoughts, Roger? Like, because everybody now knows we, we talk, our patients talk about it. The medical world, we are, we're always like, there's not enough mental health support because we would like to have more oh, counseling. It, it, uh, let, let me say one thing about and that. And just a minute. If, if there's a mental health crisis that everyone spews, and 25% of the freaking population is on medication. We should be the happy, the happiest effing place in the world. <laughs> right. This should be Disney World with like tulips and happiness everywhere. It's not. We, we're making right. the freaking right. crisis. Right. We are. And it's purposeful. And there's way too many mental health clinicians. There's way too many psychiatrists. There's way too many psychologists. There's way too many therapists. So first of all, the important thing to recognize is our default network is resilience, right? If you just took away all this intense focus on our, our mental health and people were left to themselves to have to face the problems that existed and overcome them, they'd find a path. I think sometimes what is the most critical mental health and effective mental health therapy is to get out of the way and let yes. people, their natural resilience, go ahead and just face the problems that exist in their lives and overcome them. So my, my grandfather was World War II veteran and uh, fought in the Pacific War, the Pacific conflict. And my wife's grandfather was World War II veteran, Battle of the Bulge. 
So he was in a trench throughout an entire winter uh, in Bastogne being bombarded by enemy shells from the German army. And I used to ask him questions about that when he was alive. And he said, I went through my rations in like the first two days. And I went like 30, 35 days without really eating anything. I was freezing. He says, you get out of a situation like that, everything in life is easy. So some of it's perspective too, right? Mm -hmm. If we are, if our default is resilience, then there is something that is learned through going through struggle. And what's different now in this generation is we don't teach re resilience. We've lost the language of suffering. In fact, our emotional states are under attack. The medical establishment talks about emotions as if they're symptoms as an illness when I talk about them as they're necessary for transformation. They are a gift that's provided to you. So if you, if you mass brainwash kids in public school systems and through the media to take care of your mental health, what are you doing? You're getting them to focus all their... Uh, their attention on themselves, their own feelings, their own experiences. That's a recipe for making somebody miserable. I've never met anybody in my career who was happier from focusing on themselves. But when your attention's outward, I mean, you're serving your community, you're, in you're a kid, you're in sports, you're in activity, school matters, you got two parents that love you and push you to go beyond what your mind is going to tell you to do. Well, you develop strong and resilient kids who are become adults who are you know, willing to take the appropriate risks. And if we normalize suffering, well, life's going to bring along its really challenging moments in life. Okay, I've been here before. I can handle this. I can get through that. That learning is really critically important. But when then you start talking about kids as if they're fragile, they can't handle these things. You have helicopter parents. You got more adult involvement than at any other point in history. You're telling them if they feel something, it's a symptom of their mental illness. What is taking care of your mental illness? What is taking care of your mental health? It's code word for taking a drug. It's marketing, propaganda, and it's nonsense. And this is where I'm so disappointed with my profession. How can you be a clinical psychologist or a therapist and be so scared of a person's emotions and then condition them to be scared of their emotions too? This is why I think it's a, it's a purposeful operation to make people sick and dependent because it goes against everything we know historically and what we know even in psychological science about what it takes to regulate emotions and to become resilient. And so we're Just, creating so, so, generations. I was going to say, so, but there's a line and I don't want our audience to get lost in the fact that when that where there's trauma. So we were talking about war and yeah, it teaches resilience, but then, you know, you look at all the trauma from Vietnam vets and what they've gone through and all that PT. I mean, then there's the line of that and same with, say kids that have gone through something horrific, abuse, et cetera. There's the, yeah, suck it up. Being a teenager and going through puberty as a girl is no fun. So don't, don't, you know, now we've gone to, oh, you, you have these horrible feelings about being a teenager. So you want to cut your breasts and your penis off because you, you don't, they don't like, you don't like how they make you feel with hormones. We're doing that. And, but then there's the other side, the extreme of, a traumatic event happening to kids where they truly do need therapy to help figure out how that hurt them. No, I'm not saying a pill, but so, you know no, what I mean? And you, so let so, me give you some data on that. So, uh -huh. that, you know, we, you're actually wrong. And I study okay. this stuff. Uh, therapy is, is not, does not come without its harms. Okay. Mm -hmm. So first of all, about 80% of somebody who's gone through a traumatic event is going to naturally recover from that traumatic event without any PTSD symptoms. So PTSD symptoms, PTSD is real. It's debilitating. And I, and that's an area of specialty for me. But okay. a couple of things that we know, that if you force somebody to talk about a traumatic event within its first 90 days, you increase the likelihood that you're going to develop PTSD. Okay? And that's not how, that's not how human beings naturally recover. Human beings do not recover from a traumatic event by being forced to talk to something on a random Tuesday at 4 p.m. because that's your session with your, with your therapist. It doesn't work that way. There's times to face it internally. There's times to talk about it with loved ones and community support. There's times when uh, you have to focus on school or get back to life. And we see just how naturally resilient people are. 
But in my field, they'll force somebody to talk about something quickly, like within the first 30 days, which increases the likelihood that they're going to have a traumatic event. This is established science in my field. And then, so if, let's see if someone really does develop PTSD, right? Let's say, you know, you're, you're three months in and they're significantly impaired and there's a lot of hypervigilance and fear and self-blame and it's impacted their functioning. Well, there are established protocols and ways of working with that person to restore them back to their previous functioning, right? There is wisdom through suffering. They deserve the time to talk about it, to face it. And there needs to be an active therapy that, uh, that exist for it. But that rarely even happens in our field. What you're doing is you're going to prescribe them a drug, which is going to increase um, the, the possibility that they become patients for life. So now they become chronic mental health patients with a PTSD diagnosis that they're going to hold on to, to for life. The therapist, in all likelihood, probably has very basic or minimal training on how to actually intervene with post-traumatic stress. And they're likely to keep that patient for potentially years. And now there's this mindset that's been developed. Now that you are mentally ill and that's been created in, your, in their consciousness. And now they're being told by medical professionals, by mental health professionals, mostly what they can't be, what they can't, what can't happen. And they're, now they go through the rest of their life like they're mentally ill. There are ways to work with people, but that is not what has become standard. And so we mass say like, hey, well, we always get into this argument, right? So when I have this, these discussions, somebody says, well, what about these conditions? And what about these severe conditions? And, you know, they require this and that. Well, this is true, right? But it's a lot smaller than the people that are actually accessing the therapy. We have such a large amount of people who are accessing therapy for every single problem that exists okay. in their life. Yeah. And yeah. it's creating dependence. I've got a, I've got a waiting list that is 150 to 200 people constantly, right? And I'm trying to weed it out to see, okay, who is really suffering? Who is suicidal? Who is, you know, in episodes of bulimia or severe OCD, or who might be uh, exhibiting these symptoms of post traumatic stress? And how can we weed them out to get them the care that they they need? Um, but Again, it's like what I mentioned before, by the time they get into my door, they're on like four, five, six psychiatric drugs and they're a shell of their former self. Well, just think of it this way. Just think, just think about if, if you, if you fall off your motorcycle and break your femur and you go and the trauma surgeon puts you together, is he going to say, okay, now what we need you to do is in the next three days, you need to get back on your running routine and you should be up to six miles by the end of the week. It's like, no, you sit there and you heal. Yeah. And then to really heal the bone, once you're mostly recovered, you do have to, tr you do have to pound it. The, it the, it's not going to ultimately heal unless you walk on it and it gets stimulation. And, and why, why would our minds be any different? You know, you have a traumatic event. The last thing you want to do is go right back. Let's talk about that awful gang rape that you suffered. No, let's not. Let's let it all settle down, see where this ends up. And then we can potentially do the, the appropriate therapy later. And it sounds so completely nuts in the orthopedic realm, but it's probably more nuts in the psychiatric realm. Yeah, no, and that's actually, that's a brilliant comparison too. Um, here's what I, I, I generally will see. Since I have a background in the treatment of eating disorders, that I'll see somebody who, who faced a traumatic incident, you know, most often it's some form of sexual abuse, sexual assault, sex trafficking, and the way that they cope with what happened to them is they may turn to an eating disorder or they may turn to substance abuse or they harm themselves in, in certain ways. So if somebody comes into me and they're binging and purging three, day, three times a day and have been doing it for two years, are drinking a lot of alcohol, using drugs, it's very clear that that's what they're using to mask their trauma, to deal with their trauma symptoms. If I force them to talk about what happened to them five years ago. What do you think is going to happen? All those other behaviors are going to intensify. It's going to worsen because they don't know how to cope with that trauma. And so you need to have people who know how to get people out of those cycles of eating disorders and, and substance abuse. And then you also have to prepare them for what a trauma therapy would look like with adequate coping skills and supports. Um, and again, that's not standard. We 
we'll see people continue to say, well, you, it's the trauma that led to these behaviors. And so you need to address the trauma. Well, no, not if they're living like that, they're going to kill themselves. And so that's why I'm so outspoken about with my field, because it's almost impossible for me to find somebody to hire somebody who has this adequate, both science-based background, but is compassionate and also can motivate people to do hard things. It's almost impossible because they're indoctrinated into this these left-wing ideological academic programs that are overly fragilizing uh, patients, that they're identifying them as mentally ill. They're getting caught up in identity politics. And, you know, I'll, I'll literally interview somebody who says they're a... Um, they're a social justice orientation. I'm like, what is that? Oh, tell me how you treat bulimia as a social justice orientation. And they'll go over some nonsense about oppression and oppression leading itself to, and then name the, you know, the, the DSM diagnosis. I mean, that's brainwashing. And that's part of the cultural problems that we're experiencing. Wow. So are you going to, talk about your experience well you can go ahead what, so, what are you thinking no but it, i mean it, it, it's fascinating i thought because, you were i thought you were talking about me there for a minute <laughs> well <laughs> yeah because my... yeah, i mean may was and we've been very open about yeah. this on the podcast so it's not a no-go zone but she she was sexually molested by a, a middle school teacher from what fourth to sixth grade mm -hmm. became bulimic anorexic years and years and years of treatment therapy etc but you know what there was a secret sauce and this was long after we were married so this is 10 years down the road of of you know almost two decades down from the original trauma that secret sauce that took away all of her urges to to do any eating disorder guess, guess what it was that stops uh, cravings and ocd like thoughts prozac the new wonder drug and then what worked even better than Prozac, which was almost, which was truly miraculous, was forgiveness. Mm. Once she had forgiven the abuser, everything literally like Pilgrim in John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, the, the weighted burden rolled off of her back, literally in seconds. Yeah, I mean, I can attest to that because, uh, you know, I've, I've worked with survivors of like, horrific rape and abuse um and that forgiveness piece which again is is written about in the bible it's written about cross-culturally it's 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 a really important concept for for us to be able to understand in mental health and of course it's not going to be discussed in training programs and you're not really going to find you know therapists that are going to to really understand what forgiveness means and how that can serve you in, in your growth. And in a lot of ways, you're, you're, you're choosing, it doesn't mean you agree with what the person did to you. Right, right. You're actually choosing that no longer will they occupy that space in your mind. Can I, right. can I tell you a story? Of course. Uh, please. <laughs> I just got permission to tell this story because it's fascinating and it changed my life. About, it's about two years ago, case comes on my desk about a woman who was sex trafficked, you know, help, you know, held against her, her will. She was actually slept in like a dog cage, was treated like an animal by the most horrific of, uh, of abuser that you could imagine. And she, she wanted to come in and, and, and see me and be part of a, a greater trauma-based program that we have here. And so I expected to meet a woman who was extremely guarded, post-traumatic stress, vigilant, suffering, struggling. And it turned out uh, in no way to be that case. I met the most wise person I have still yet to ever meet in my entire life. I spent a few sessions wondering what I missed. Um, because how does somebody go through something like that? come out the other side and have such wisdom. I wanted to sit and just continue to listen to her, but I explored everything that happened to her. She was willing to talk about it. And one day I said, how were you able to survive that and speak the way you are speaking right now? And she told me that 
when she was being assaulted, God came to her and turned everything around as love. So she experienced only love when she was being raped, when she was being tortured. She also experienced images of her assailants' childhoods, the same things happening to them. She ended up escaping. This is all documented. She ends up escaping and gets to a police station. She you know, tells the, the, the police everything that, you know, that happened. Um, they take her to a hospital, and she tells the medical professionals what I just told you. Uh, how God protected her, turned everything to love and uh, this deep compassion for what happened to them. And then they they viewed it that she was in a psychotic episode and, you know, obviously gave her a number of antipsychotics and then, you know, kind of pushed her into the system, which eventually brought her back, you know, brought her to, to me. And she saw what happened to her as something that was part of a, a purposeful soul journey she saw herself as a spiritual being in uh, this physical human life that she needed to learn the things that happened to her. And, you know, I never heard anyone talk like this before. And she said that the only reason she's able to is because of, you know, that experience, that spiritual experience that got labeled as psychotic or psych- psychosis. And so I just... I ended up, um, you know, letting her know I didn't think she needed therapy. And she agreed with me and said that um, she came here as a messenger. And (laughs) I love it. And so, you know, I kept that to myself for quite some time um, because, I mean, I talked to with colleagues, but, you know, I also wanted to be very careful of this woman's privacy. And so uh, what I, I'm going on a larger podcast at the end of the month that has hundreds and thousands of uh, viewers. And so I emailed her actually this week. And I said that um, I just asked her permission to tell her story um, because I think it's fascinating. And I also think it's informative of where we are in Western culture, where the manner in which we look, we, uh, it, we see a phenomenon like that as, a, as if it's an illness, and then the manner we treat it, which is through pharmaceuticals and drugs, which can create further problems. And she said, absolutely. And, you know, I'd love for that story to, to be told. You know, I, I want to help other people. I made sure I got it right again. You know, yes, turned everything into love. It was a, it was a transformative experience. I think we all have the capabilities of doing it. And then she gave me another message. <laughs> She's like, can I can I, you know, I've been holding on to this. There's, there's, you know, one final message for you. And, um, it was basically around like this idea of, of, of stop searching, stop looking, because since that, uh, event, you know, some of the things she told me, uh, w- within my meetings with her was that everything is happening for us and that's, and then see God in everybody. And so since then, really, I've been kind of sometimes in my own head a little bit too much, which is just like searching for greater messages or seeing God in everybody, or, you know, what is the purpose for this happening for this individual? Like take, moving away from the pathological lens of, uh, of, a, of a psychologist who's trained in a diagnostic system and trying to see things from just different perspectives. Like what is serving you? Why are you feeling this way? And it's been, it's transformed my work with people, right? To move away from what you're feeling as a disease. Like you have major depressive disorder, you post-traumatic stress disorder, moving completely away from it. And then talking about it in terms of how, how, how does it serve your growth? And so forgiveness comes up a lot more frequently now. And I just, and, and now I'm, I'm, I'm meeting just incredible, amazing people that if they're provided that environment to talk about things and see it from that lens, they don't want to be on drugs. They don't want to numb what they're feeling. They actually want to feel because it's actually really critically important for that transformation. So now I feel like I have to tell this story all the time because first of all, she told me she was a messenger. So I have to spread the message, <laughs> but it's, but it's also, it's also profoundly, you know, wise. And if you can go through something like she went through and come out the other side, why would we fragilize anybody? Why won't we see them about what their 
potentially capable of achieving in life. And we see this in the post-traumatic growth literature, right? And may, maybe you've experienced this yourself, that you've come out the other side and you're doing great transformative things in your career, in your life. It's made you a better person, actually, by going through it. Maybe you're more wise. Maybe you have greater empathy and love and connection for other people. I mean, that's what I see from people who've been traumatized. I see them as the most wise people I've ever met, the most loving people I've ever met. They just have to get through the fear part. And once they do and they process it and then forgiveness is on the other side, I see a completely different human. That's better than before. No, absolutely. And <laughs> uh, we, so I've been going through a really difficult time this last year started about two years ago, but uh, you know, not to, you know, we shared a lot on the podcast and in my writings where, and as a Christian, it got, I feel like God's been stripping all my defenses of all my things that I hang on to away slowly to the point where we recently moved to another state. And it's, I've been left, I won't say with nothing. I still have this wonderful guy and a great family and my faith, but things that I would normally you know, when you're stressed, you have your things, you comfort you turn to. For me, it was fitness, uh, friends. We moved from our faith community, my home, the 30 years that I nested, my book. Like, it's all these little things that were stripped away. Um, I, anyway, I've been going through this growth thing and really struggling and really in a deep place. And like very to the point of, you know, I think I need to talk to count. Do I need counseling? Do I good Lord, I don't want drugs again. <laughs> and, um, you know, exploring different options. And I'm like, you know, no, I'm here in this pit again for a reason, because it's, uh, I need to grow. There's some lesson. I need to walk through this fire. And we just interviewed Dr. Keith Ablo, who uh, that <laughs> wow. episode is amazing. And he, you know, I don't know how much you know about him, but he talks about pain to power. And I started to think back to that again, because I've been listening to his stuff and I'm what I've come through in the past, what I've come through even in my lifetime and struggles we've had that, you know, I believe because I believe in God that, you know, life sucks and he doesn't want us to hurt, but these things in life happen for a reason. And it's how you learn from it and grow into something better. And so I think back to my experience and it's what I wish that on my kids, heck no, but life is about life sucks and life has these horrible things that we either, you know, let them wound us permanently and don't grow through. And at the time, you know, I was a kid, right. you don't know, but if I hadn't had that experience, if I hadn't have suffered through all that bulimia and all the things that came along with it, it wouldn't have brought me to my faith and it wouldn't have, you're right, given me a whole new way of, um, empathy and looking at other people struggling with self-image type stuff. And I've done a lot of that in my career. It's provided me with so many tools and insights, compassion, and my faith that I would never change that. And so going forward, even now, you know, because I'm not a perfect person and I have all these struggles again, and I, at least I can look back and I look at that time and I go, shit, this sucks right now, but look what how I grew, look what it gave me, um, with my faith, um, and my career and what I can put pass on to my kids and friends and community. All right, I'll take it. Uh, it's iron sharpening iron. It's the refining fire flames. Um, Sorry. and bring it on. And, um, it, yeah. So it's kind of a, no one likes pain and hurting and we want it to go away fast, but if people can just uh, go, it's going to be all right. We'll get through this. It might take a couple of weeks. It might take years, but growth and positivity can come out of it. And you surround yourself with supportive people that, you know, you can share with and can help you. Um, then, yeah, I mean, exactly what your uh, client friend <laughs> um, said that it's, uh, I would, you know, I wouldn't change any of that now. Yeah, and and it's not saying that I I, I wish that on anybody or no, of course believe not. that is believe that is necessary for anyone to be able to you know continue to evolve in 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 this world. But I start right. even thinking about like the you know the resurrection differently, 
right? Like the the suffering and the dying and then the resurrection is very metaphorical too about the struggles that we go through as human beings and then the need to awaken, the need to uh, continue to evolve and resurrect and transform through that. And that process seems to be very necessary for our experience as human beings to be able to evolve. I do see you know, that the challenges of, of living to be episodic, that they are, they are episodes that we have to walk through. We have to, it's the dark night of the soul. We need to kind of walk through that. We need to face what has happened to us. Uh, we have to learn and we have to find ways to, uh, you know, to kind of grow through that. And what's on the, uh, what's on the other side is a, is a, is a redemption. What's on the other side is a wisdom uh, that po- the the research in my field on post traumatic growth is really inspiring, and that's why it's what I do love about my work, and that's why I'm kind of part of this anti uh, you know pathology movement. Like I I hate all the 300 plus disorders that are medicalized. I think we're medicalizing every aspect of being human, and they're we're just using another method to kind of numb out or detach people from that experience. I'm not in support of. Uh, most psychiatric drugs for most situations, because I actually think they impair healing. Mm -hmm. You know, Mm -hmm. you know, you you mentioned it before about how important it is. Like, uh, you know, if you have a a fracture and you need that time to heal and we need that time emotionally too to be able to experience its energy. Emotions are energy in motion. And we actually need that energy to be experienced and to move. And it's really important. Some of it's you know, clear survival mechanisms, right? So fear is a survival mechanism. We don't want to numb out or drug out fear. And if you do have post-traumatic stress, you know, you know, one of the, one of the mechanisms that lead to post-traumatic stress is this concept of uh, avoidant coping, you know, thought suppression, emotional suppression, or, you know, turning to drugs, alcohol, or other means, because it's so important to process what happened to you, to move that energy, to move that emotion. You have to almost be able to reacclimate to what's safety and what's what's dangerous, right? So you you become harmed by another person, you're going to overgeneralize that threat. Now everyone is going to be harmed, you know, could be potentially harmful. So you need to stay safe, right? That's a survival mechanism. But in order to live this life with love and compassion and to achieve the things you need to, you have to be able to discern, uh, you know, can I open up and accept love again in my life? Can I go out into my community? Can I trust people again? There's a lot of good people out there. And just because this person did this to me, doesn't mean that everyone's bad, right? And so moving from that overgeneralization of threat to being able to trust yourself again is a really critical piece to overcoming trauma. And so I do see, I do see people as extremely resilient and have the ability to do that. But I think I'm part of a system that sees people as sick that sees people as fragile. I, you know, I was just thinking as a, I don't know if you have kids, but as a parent and, you know, parent groups, you, everyone's like, I just want my child to be happy. I just want them to have a happy life and that I want to protect them and parents swooping in to help their kids through childhood, teenagehood, early adulthood. They're in their thirties and they're still protecting them. And, and I'm thinking, but, why do we want to do that when it's the, you know, you don't want horrific experiences, but it's when you fail and fall and go through the struggle that you become a better, stronger human being. And we all want our kids uh, and humanity to, to be that. So I, but what, I guess my thinking is, what the hell is happy? (laughs) Right. You know, There's nothing that pisses me off more than I just want my kid to be happy. Okay. So you put him in an adult diaper and you give him, you know, an endless supply of whatever happy juice in his veins. And he sits there shitting himself with a, with a devilish grin on his face for the next 65 years. And he's happy. No, he's worthless. No, I think that I want my kids to be awesome. I want them to go out and have adventures and to fall down and to pick themselves up. And happy will come. Happy is a byproduct of a well-lived life. No. It sure as shit is not a goal. I mean, that's, yeah. that is right. the dumbest right. goal in the world. I mean, that's that that's living. That's like, I want to have the greatest marriage in the world, and I'm going to do it with Tinder. <laughs> <laughs> and my point being, you know, people want their kids to be successful and, and have a great life. But yet, we're going about it wrong by overprotecting them 
not letting them go through the struggles of life and figure stuff out. And so then you want to throw pills at them. You want to take them to the doctor or get them a counselor or, yeah, and that goes all wrong. Well, that's the biggest scam out there that the natural state of, of human beings are, is to be happy. And anything that's outside of that means that you're somehow disordered or some way. Right. No, it's not the case. You know, I want people to be able to experience joy when the moments allow it. But actually, joy is a fleeting experience. Like, look back at your life and what are the most joyful experiences? It didn't last for days, weeks, months. It's a fleeting experience. And life is, emotions are a lot like the weather, right? There's going to be your stormy days and there's going to be cold winters and, you know, there's going to be sunny days too. And that's just normal. That's part of the human experience. So when I say we've lost our language of suffering, when we've created this uh, delusion of what it means to be human, right? I, I can't believe it. People come in, these young people come into my center and they say, I have anxiety. And I say, thank God, right? Like um, imagine if you did not have anxiety. That's a, a extremely important and valuable human emotion. But they're conditioned to view that anxiety as some disease state that they have that they have to rid themselves of. And the paradox here is the more you try to rid yourself of negative emotions, the more you're going to feel them yes. because you're developing an adversarial relationship with your own emotional experience. Now you have a fear of fear. Now you have a fear of emotions. And what do you do when you have a fear of your own emotions? You become incapacitated, right? Because now you, you believe that there's something actually wrong with you. And most of the work I have to do is think there's everything that's right with you. These emotions fit the context of the situation that you're experiencing. They're supposed to be there. They're part of your journey. Now, what are you going to do with it, right? Ultimately, what are we going to do with what you're experiencing now? Are you going to let it control and run your life? Or are you going to use it to your advantage? And changing that relationship to what someone is experiencing internally is really the secret sauce that changes it, in my opinion. That you, we have to become a lot more tolerant and accepting of what we experience internally. Our minds are going to create all types of problems. That's what the human mind is designed to do. It's going to want to worry. It's going to want to go back into the past and try to figure out, you know, all the things you did wrong. And you're, you're going to ruminate on times where you became embarrassed. It's going to try to predict the next threat that exists. It's going to distract you from the moment. You know, that's a untethered mind. You know, that's like a trying to train a puppy and a puppy's, you know, <laughs> you know, being distracted by everything that's going on in the yard. Right. We have the ability to gain control of our minds. We really, really do. But you're not going to do it if you're distracting into everything. Social media, your phone, mm -hmm. Netflix, food, alcohol. Now, you have to have some disciplined focus that exists in your life to be able to be intentional about what's right in front of you. And we have to be able to achieve that state as a human being. And if we're distracted by any thought that comes up or a or an emotional state, and that emotional state then drives what we do that day, that's the recipe for psychiatric disorders, right? We have to teach people to be more resilient and how to respond to the challenges that are typical, that are normal, right? If you feel good in today's culture, there's something wrong with you. Let's face it. Like everything that's going on in our society, if you feel good all the time, you're delusional. You're in some fantasy world. Right? Or checked out. Or you're yeah. drunk. <laughs> yeah. Or you're drunk. Or, or check, checked no, out. But, that, but, that's, but that, that, that's, exactly, that's exactly the point. I mean, I've, I've, had, I've had, you know, I mean, I've done this for 32 years. So you, get all, you become very close to these families that you take care of. You know, we were country doctors. We knew everybody. I delivered tons of, I mean, I went to, took my kid to a monster truck show. And I think half the kids in that part of the stadium I had delivered. And, you know, so you go through, you walk through a lot of tragedy with people. And, and, you know, you, you sit there and you counsel a 40 year old woman whose husband woke up dead and you look at her and you say, you know what? I, I don't have any words for you that are going to make this better. I do know two things, though. I do know that the, the pain you feel, this is what pain was made for. This is what grief was made for, because if it wasn't this painful, what did the relationship mean? Mm. And you'll never get over this, but you will get through it. And that's all you need is meaning. <laughs> yeah. And, and that, and that's wisdom right there. Right. And, and instead we're sending messages. They're even trying to drug grief right now. Right. Well, grief. Instead, I saw, I, I saw an 89, excuse me. I saw like an 89 year old or 92 year old woman in, in the clinic, a, you know, a few months ago. And she was on pick the SSRI of the month club 
for grief disorder because she lost her husband of like 70 years. I'm like, how do you quantify a loss of a partner of 70 years? It's impossible. Yeah. I don't know what that means. You brought up a really good point about meaning. You know, I, I ask a lot of my clients, I said, if I can go into my drawer, pull out a pill and you take it once and it'll take away any negative emotional experience that you'll ever feel. You'll never feel loss or grief. You'll never feel anger. You'll never be sad. You'll never feel anxious. Would you take that pill? Right. Now, if you're of a certain age, right? If you're over 30, it's 100%. Nobody's going to say, yes, I'm going to take that pill. And I say, why? And, you know, people are, are, are much wiser than we give them credit for because then they recognize that, you know, can we really feel love if we don't understand what loss is? Can we really appreciate happiness and joy when it's there if we don't know the other side? There's this duality that exists and this rich tapestry of all emotions that they all work beautifully and they're miraculously designed in a way to serve us. Now, the younger they are, they'll say, hell yeah, give me that, right? Their, their brains haven't been fully formed yet and they think life is just about feel, feeling good and they're served this bullshit and this ideology that, you know, you know, life should be a certain way and you're, you're in a, you're, you're oppressed and you're disabled and, you know, you, you, you should feel good all the time here, take this pill. And so then there's a lot of education that has to take place. Yeah. It, but I mean, it's, it's really true. I, the other thing I, you know, we, we should, we could get maybe into some practical steps because I think that there's a, a couple, a couple things that, that really help. Uh, I read a really excellent Substack yesterday by uh, the bad cat, Elgato Malo. He is just a brilliant writer from, um, I think he's from uh, Puerto Rico. But anyways, he's, he talked about this absence of struggle and how like human beings are made to struggle. So we have these protests for Hamas and all this completely crazy stuff going on by people still wearing masks with purple hair because they have been nothing but wildly affluent. And so they're, they're literally rebelling against their affluence because human adolescents are made to struggle against something. And we're all made to struggle against something. And when you remove struggle, it's basically like you give them an autoimmune disorder of struggle. Mm. And they struggle against nonsense instead yeah. of like real things. And yeah. I was thinking about that and it, it it really is true. And it's, it's a lot of the, you know, the, the stuff that Jordan Peterson really pushes where if you, if, you know, the, the evidence that if you purposely put yourself in painful situations, you know, whether it's the, the cold tub or going for a run or going to the gym in the morning where you personally pick suffering, those people are happier and way more resilient in every area of their life. And I'm like, duh. <laughs> it's indisputable. You know, and, and, the, and the science around this is around like dopamine, right? If you think about, you know, how, how we've evolved, right? We, we suffered. Our ancestors suffered. We'd go through extended periods of famine. We'd have to hunt our own food, you know, and, and you'd have to do really, really hard work to be able to hunt down a meal or to survive. And that's what kind of dopamine was there for it's like it's, it's to drive you to do these hard things then you know you you kill the deer and you have you know meat to serve your family and you experience this rush of of like adrenaline and joy right because now you can survive again right and then there's this positive mental benefit until you rest and you have to do the entire thing you know all over again and our lives are very similar in that way is that we get this this rush of positive emotions from doing hard things. So then what happens if our brains can be hijacked through, through comfort, like pornography, for example? You know, you used to have to work hard for, to be able to have sex, you know, to, to meet a woman, to court a woman. You know, that's the difference. I talk about this on my podcast with my brother. We're Generation X men, middle-aged. You know, I'm going to be 48 this summer. And, you know, I had, we had to work hard to be able to develop a relationship with a woman. I couldn't just slip into their DMs, you know, we'd have to go <laughs> <No>. out, <laughs> you'd have to be interesting, <laughs> you know, you'd have to know how to talk to a woman and start dating them and develop a relationship with casual sex and pornography. It's getting this like fake rush that doesn't serve their well-being. There's nothing hard about it. And the same thing with bad food and so forth. The easier things are, the worse we are as human beings, our health and everything else. 
And so there's like a lot of value in the struggle. And whether that's to get your to get your education, whether that's to keep yourself in in, in good condition, or whether that's to be in a, a, a meaningful relationship, not, not something that's just quick and easy, you know, they have lasting mental health benefits. We live in a culture that looks for this quick and easy fix. You know, take this pill, buy this product, you know, succumb to my ideas. And, and, and then we, we have all the solutions. You, you know, it, it's this commodification of mental health right now. And, you know, it's this communication that everything, it, you know, should be easy. And if it's not easy, that there's something wrong with you. And it's the exact opposite, right? That there is mental benefits from doing really, really hard things. There's this program out there called 75 Hard right now. Uh, and I did this about a year and a half ago. It's 75 straight days where you have to do two workouts a day, 45 minutes each. One of them has to be outside. You can't drink, no alcohol. You got to choose. Uh, you have to choose a diet. You have to adhere to it. You have to read 10 pages of nonfiction a day, and you have to drink a certain amount of water. And it's really challenging, right? Wow. You have to do a four. Two, you know, it, it beats you down physically. Two workouts a day. Um, but you can just go for a 45 minute walk because one of them has to be outside. But if it's pouring rain, you know, you're in a torrential downpour, you have to do it, right? You have to commit to it. <laughs> and, and you're, you're hanging out with your buddies and you're doing things and they're having, they're having a beer or two and, and you can, and you're drinking water. It's a hard thing to do. You have to stick to the same diet. It's a really, really hard thing to do, but there are benefits because it also changes your perspective about what's hard. Right. So it's getting it's so hard to get people to to move now and, and exercise. Right. Because of this, because of the comforts that exist in, in life, that just getting some people to do a 40, one 40 minute walk is really, really hard to do. Uh, but it is your perception of, of what is difficult. Right. And so um, we're certainly not better off by all these conveniences. You know, I, I honestly think there has to be the pendulum has to swing where people have to move away from the technology and and the smartphone. If anything, any parents that are are out there, don't let your kids have access to that supercomputer in their pocket and social media. Um, God, 15 might be the earliest, you know, and we have tons of research for that. So now you make some in, in, incredible points about how important it is to embrace discomfort and embrace suffering. And we get tougher and more resilient in that regard. And then the mental health benefits are lasting because, you know, the next hard thing that comes in your life you know, you accept it, you understand it, you move through it, and it's part of your existence. Yeah, it's 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 amazing. You know, this I think the ultimate metaphor for what we're doing with with all of this medicalization of normal is, you know, we've given everyone a hammer. It's just in the shape of a phone, and we're beating ourselves on the head with it. And then we're going to the doctor with a headache and they're giving us a helmet. And, and, you know, and, and then we have a helmet crisis in the United States. We need more research for helmets. <laughs> Actually, we're going to yeah. raise analogy. We're, we're going to we're going to raise money for helmets. You know what? It's October. It's helmet awareness month. You know, it's, it's just like it's complete insanity. It's stop beating yourself on the head. We know what works. Get sunshine. Have good. I mean, our, our four pillars of health from our perspective are diet, exercise, sleep and relationships. If you get those, if you get. 80% grade on all four of those, you are in the fraction of a percentile on the Gaussian curve as far as how, how happy, how successful, how healthy you are. Yeah. yeah I mean, I, I, would, see I, I was going to say, and I would add, you know, we're, I'm adding to the pillars because I was listening to this amazing uh, shoot. I've got, I'll think of her name in a minute. Psychologist on Mel Robbins podcast, talk about that. And really it is the, uh, now, adding to that pillar, like the fifth thing is withdrawing from like news and social media and screen time. It's the screen time use or the lack of, because now that's affecting mental health in such a big way. We get sucked in, we waste time, we get our thoughts manipulated, it affects our emotions, attitudes on life in general. So sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, that's, that's an excellent yeah. point. I, I actually see, you know, health as, as, as freedom. Because the sicker we are, the more that we're going to be dependent on the medical system, the more we're going to be dependent on their product, which is their pharmaceutical, mm -hmm. um, the more we feel beholden to have to follow whatever their recommendations are. 
you know, we just got out of COVID. So, you know, the veil has been lifted on, you know, the corruption and the misrepresentation of scientific data and how really it's serving various industries. And you know we're going to be facing very challenging situations where, you know, the government authority, the medical authority, they're aligning together to take away freedoms, you know, get this jab in order to be able to have the freedom of this or that, the social credit system, whatever it may be. But we're, you know, slowly, actually rapidly now walking right down that path. And so that's why I think it's so important that people gain control of their health. Stop relying on doctors. You know, take control of your own health. Take control of your own understanding about what it means to live healthy. You got to break free from the restrictions of that fear-based system. It's always like, you got to screen for this and you got to be careful of this. And are you watching this and that, like whatever that's become, you know, it just creates more fear and create fear is going to create more sickness. Instead, focus on your life. It's those exact pillars that you described. Get outside, connect with nature. That sun exposure is critically important because that regulates sleep, right? That regulates mood. Make sure that you're eating Foods that are not toxic, right? I, you know, I'm sticking to some core foods. Basically, meat, <laughs> you know, is the staple of my diet. Grass-fed from from local ranchers. That's yep. basically what I'm ingest, ingesting. You know, um, I might have, you know, it's seasonal fruit, and you know, I definitely have eggs. Might have some avocados, but it's one ingredient stuff, right? I'm not. Mm -hmm. I'm, it, I, if I ever do, I told you before, if I ever do go out of, at, at a restaurant, like I, it makes me sick, you know? And so we don't even know what it means to really feel good anymore. The exercise, the movements of our, our bodies, and of course, core relationships and purpose, right? So you need to have, you need to have that quality of, of relationships because most people that are coming in to seek mental health treatment are struggling in all those areas, right? Um, but many of them will come in for, for, uh, this loneliness and this despair that they're experiencing with uh, within relationship could be friendships or romantic relationships. And so those things need to be solid. I'll also add, though, I think, you know, when it comes to purpose, there needs to be something bigger and greater than you. And so that's that greater spiritual connection, right? What what are you living for? You know, what is that purpose? Because you know, you're going to face something really hard. And what's going to get get What's going to get you through it, right? Is there something that, is it you're part of your soul growth or are you serving others? Are you serving your community? Are you serving your family? Because that intention that, that is directed outward into others, it's what makes life worth living. And without it, you are going to be lonely. You are going to be miserable. If you're completely focused on yourself and you think that uh, a quality of life is is trying to feel good all the time. And anyone who's in your life that doesn't make you really feel really good, then they should be cut out of your life. You're falling right back into the messages that are going to keep you sick and, and dependent. And so wow. I, I know, go ahead. No, it's just, it's, I just, I was going to say how, so obviously we talked about not getting your kids no, before age 15, you know, this tech to, to be going down this wormhole. But I mean, honestly, adults are just as guilty because we're like, eh, I'm a, I'm a grown up. I can self screen, whatever. But I mean, the data shows that we all spend time mindlessly numbing, scrolling in between work or when we should be going to sleep, et cetera. And obviously, I mean, I shouldn't have to ask, but it's, that plays so much into our outlook and how we're looking at the world around us, what we think is important, what we think how other people are living because it adjusts our, you know, we see all these influencers and we think, oh, they, they got this, their life's great. They're having well, fun. Yes. But, but it's also a very good reflective tool in, in some respects, right? Like I remember having this conversation with one of my friends that was a pastor and I said, you know, if where my treasure with, you know, where your heart is where your, your treasure, your, where your treasure is, your, is your heart. Uh, I got a problem because I can hardly walk inside my garage because there's so much crap in there and so many toys. So it's the same thing. Like, uh, true. You, you know, you look at your, if you, if you really want to be confronted with the, like the hollowness of your soul, look at your Instagram search. And I'm like, wow, chicks with gigantic cans and kite surfing. I'm a really <laughs> mature human being. Tell me you're not searching for that. <laughs> no, I'm just saying like, it's, you know, it's just like, you, you know, like, like, hello. 
you know, yeah. we're all guilty of this too. You know, I, I get that there's a bigger system. This system is against us. The pharmaceutical industrial, like all of this stuff, I get it. But we also have to own our own like humanity. And it's, it's, I prefer to laugh than cry, but both emotions are probably appropriate. Yeah. Stop looking. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's, that, that's the message I got from that, that one client. She said, stop searching, stop, stop looking. And one of the things that I've added into my life powerfully over the past four years has been meditation. And I now have a, a morning routine that I really look forward to. And that, that includes, you know, some, some prayer and some reflection, but it, it also includes intense exercise and it in, includes uh, meditation. And when I can just be free from the clutter of my mind. I end up going to a place where I really do feel connected to God. Uh, there are messages that are provided there. I believe I, I get some of those psychedelic experiences or some of that, that high that other people get from drugs. I get it through the quieting of the mind and, and deepening inward. And, um, you know, I, I do believe we have that Christ consciousness within us, whether you can call it the Holy Spirit. And uh, I think other, you know, faiths or other cultures might describe it as something different, but it is detaching from the ego. Like the ego has to die. You know, yes. the ego only cares about, uh, you know, this body and it cares about pleasure and it cares about your needs and all that stuff is poison, right? The, the more you try to seek out more pleasure, the more sick you're going to become because nothing's ever satisfying enough. And that's the problem with, uh, you know, Americans, American culture. There's always more stuff. There's always more things. There's always more images. There's always more sex. There's always more women. There's always another more attractive woman. There's another more interesting. Someone could always just serve you more. Right. And, uh, all of that is a, is a path towards emptiness and, you have to kind of pull yourself away from that modern lifestyle. And uh, you know, there's a lot to learn from, from our sacred traditions that exist. And, and for me, learning to quiet the mind and being able to sit in that provides an experience that is joyful and it's centered. And I think I used to think that I, I, I was searching for happiness or I was searching for feeling really good. And I think more what I'm searching for is, uh, you know, a state of peace and contentment. And if that, if that is what you can achieve in this human experience, that most of the time you're centered, you're focused, um, and you're at a, a state of peace, that's a beautiful place to be because you can serve people um, and you can focus your attention into, you know, what God is inspiring you to do. And whether that's a book, you know, boy, books they're so important right to to read and it's hard to do when you have this all this stimulation that can hijack your brain um but just to sit and to read and to reflect is just a an incredible experience and you learn so much and you know i've found out that even doing my podcast or speaking publicly the more i prepare for things the worse i am <laughs> and and the more the more that i just sit and just let it flow the yep. better I am, the more wisdom, because I have it in there, right? Because I think the spirit's in, inside of me. I've done the meditation. I, I read. I have all the experiences. You know, even right here, you know, your producer, whoever sent me all these questions, yeah. you know, I'm like, <laughs> right. we, we're off. We were off script after five minutes. So like, what, you know, why even look over all these, you know, these questions? Because you end up, you know, having to think. And when we have to think, we don't always do well. But when we be when we're present yeah. and we are just engaged with the natural flow of, of, of life, then I, I think God's working through us. No, I, it, I, I couldn't agree more. And it's amazing how the last several episodes we've done have all dovetailed together in this exact theme. Mm -hmm. We interviewed Evan Alexander, who was a neurosurgeon who had a near death experience. And, and then he introduced us to, he uses uh, bioral beats for meditation, which I find really fascinating. Yeah. And then we interviewed Keith Ablo, who, I mean, that was almost like an hour and a half of free therapy, just a tremendous guy. Um, and then we, uh, in a couple of weeks, we'll be coming out with John Burke's interview, who's a former pastor of a multi-campus church in Austin, who has interviewed 1,500 near-death experiencers. Around the world. And how, you know, guys will like, and it's like these stories are just absolutely 
crazy. Like one guy who was a, a Rwandan Muslim wakes up after dying and looks into the hole that is his grave and then becomes an Anglican pastor because he met Jesus in the afterlife. And he said, I'm, I'm the one that saves you. Go tell everybody. Even though there's death threats on his life again because he left Islam. And a I common mean, theme just I was amazing. Say among those is the e you know, the ego death kind of and I was talking to somebody about this yesterday, funny enough, about how they come back after having that experience and all the things that we think matter and all this self, you know, fulfilling sort of searching for happiness or meaning of life and all that it doesn't matter because they, you know, in their near death experience, they really realize what makes our soul come alive is well, kiteboarding is part of that, I think, and skiing, sorry, just is transform them. And then when they come back, their life is so different for like the majority of these people, a few, not so much, but you know, well, what I've said, there's a few not, but, but it's the, they're radically changed because of what they've experienced, but all this, well, because they I saw say, reality. Yeah, all this shit that we think that matters that that gives us angst and anxiety and trips us up in life and we struggle with. But it, it, it it's interesting because I came up with this quote several years ago, um, which is what when what really matters really matters. What doesn't matter doesn't matter. Mm. And, and so you know when you're really focusing on what really is the source of life. And I, you know, I think of the scriptures where it's like the kingdom of God is within you. Mm -hmm. Jesus didn't say that because it was a metaphor. That was not a parable. That was because it was absolutely correct. The kingdom yes. of God is within you. And then you're talking about peace and contentment. You know, it's what Paul says. Godliness with contentment is great gain. And so, you know, our endless dark side of, you know, capitalism is you're one Lexus away from contentment. Well, they've been running that same ad during Christmas for the last 25 years. No, you're no, you're one Lexus away from discontentment. It's exactly the opposite. And, 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 and so it's like deep breath enough. <laughs> Have you read the books of Dr. Raymond Mooney? No, no. Uh, life he, after life, I think is one of them. He also, former physician, um, interviewed physicians and, uh, and, and patients who died and then returned. And they do share the same oh, general yeah. story. Yeah. John, John mentioned, mentioned him. him. Yeah. Yes. Cause yes, he had, yes. he's a colleague. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, these, these are the challenges that as a, as a psychologist doing therapy, you get into these conversations quite frequently. So I'm like, <laughs> I'm working with a gentleman who's, he found his 15 year old daughter dead in her bed, you know, and, um, he wasn't somebody who, um, was raised with any religious teaching or background, but he wants to believe, uh, but you, you ask yourself these, these questions like me as a therapist who just, you know, working with someone who just lost a child, how do they overcome something like that? if they don't believe that there's something much greater than them or that they're going to see that, that see their child again, that they'll be reunited with that soul. Right. And interestingly enough, there are academic programs all around the country who do examine these things scientifically, right? We, we do have very strong evidence of life after life. And um, what I was always questioning and I recently got a, a text message from my cousin. So my, my cousin's a Navy SEAL. And he was one uh, of the Navy SEALs who refused the COVID vaccine and then was represented by uh, Robert F. Kennedy. But he's considering his next career once he gets discharged from the military. And he sent a text to me that said, how do you reconcile with psychology's failure to acknowledge the soul, you know, for example? And I remember I gave him some kind of bullshit answer that you can still help people, um, you know, who, who aren't religious or, you don't who, who don't believe in this because you can change behavior and, you know, behavior that positively change can enhance someone's life. And to a degree that there's truth to that, but he brings up a, a really critical point that how are you part of a greater field 
that says they're both, they're scientific, they're ethical, and they're interested in creating a life of value and purpose. And then you pretty much ignore the most important aspect, which is the soul and meaning and purpose in life. And so those are the challenges that I, that I certainly face every day in a secular society where there's been a war on God. Um, you know, there really has in our, in our popular culture. If you go into mainstream academia you, to our scientists, your, your medical professionals, like how do they, uh, you know, during your medical training, how do they approach God? How do they approach the soul, the purpose, the meaning of, of life, uh, your body as, as being aligned with the spirit and how health can be viewed from a perspective of, um, you know, disease because it can really legitimately mean that your body is not at ease. It is not connected to spirit. It is not aligned with its purpose. And the role of stress and, be, and, and, and feeling lack of purpose can lead the body to actually be sick. Like, how is that taught in medical school? Well, it's not. It's not. No, it's, it's just it's, we're just a neurochemical entanglement that your brain influences well, right. your but, but, end but, organs. I mean, and- the reductionist, I mean, look, the, the proof, the proof, is in the pudding is in the eating as whatever the adage is, you know, the idiom. And, and, and when you look around, okay. Like the, we were at, we were at a home group last night and, you know, I, I was challenging a little bit of the standard medical model. And I said, well, how, how's it working out for you? You know, since 1972, when we started flooding the entire landscape with high fructose corn syrup, and we have more diabetic medications than, then we know what to do with. We have, you know, more pills, more protocols, more whatever. And what do we have? We have more fat people that are in terrible shape that have. So if the system worked, if, if the, if the dietary pyramid worked, we shouldn't need any of this and we should all look like Joe Rogan. Well, we don't because it doesn't work because it's the problem. And, it's so obvious to me when you take a bigger picture view. It's like we have these ads for Jardians where they're normal normalizing obesity. They have morbidly obese people dancing around. It's like, what's the message? You can be, you can completely ignore your health. You can completely ignore your diet if you just take this pill. And oh, by the way, one of the side effects of this pill is you might get necrophi- necrotizing fasciitis of your perineum. So it will, it will eat that nether region between your genitals and your anus. That's and, 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 like, and you sit there and you go, <laughs> like, honestly, it, it, like South Park can't even write stuff this good. It's so crazy. <laughs> and, and, and I'm like, I'm like, like, they literally, they have a guy on that one ad. We'll, we'll put it on one of our shows, I think. And, and it's like, oh, he, yes. has, he, has yes. d- he has D-cup man boobs. Yes. And I'm, I'm thinking to myself, Who's the agent for actors where they're like, no, no, we need somebody in worse shape. That guy's in way too good a shape. Get us the guy ah, that's yeah. way worse shape Absolutely. To, to cast this ad. And, and, and that, that isn't a joke. That actually is oh. clearly happening. It's like, no, that guy's not fat enough. We need a fatter guy for this ad. I'm like, it, it makes idiocracy. Idiocracy is prophecy. It's not a movie. You know, the scam is so evident right now. I don't know how people continue to fall for it. Like that's the shocking piece of all this to me. Right. That I've actually gone into like literature on, you know, how people are brainwashed to try to understand how you don't see what's clearly in front of you. Why would you continue to rely on a medical system that is responsible for widespread illness and sickness? Right. Like an entire system that works together with big food and big pharma. You know, you're, you're, you're creating disease in order to create an industry. You know, the evidence is clearly in front of us. Everyone's getting sicker. Why would we follow those mainstream recommendations? I don't get it. I mean, the last thing you're going to the last thing I'll, you'll see me is in an allopathic medical uh, system unless I have like broken bones or I need emergency care. Right. I'm not going there to check my health, get health recommendations, things like that. Because, you know, for me, real medicine is sun. It is love. It is exercise. It is nature. 
you know, medicine doesn't come as you know, these synthetically created compounds and factories. Like that's altering the human experience, right? That's human. The, we haven't genetically evolved to to be able to even ingest what they're what they're giving us, and yeah, I just think it's it's part of a greater you know transhumanist anti-human yeah. movement, really, where you know they really do see us you know as as parasites for the most part you know worthy of experimentation and there's a lot of experience we've been lab rats for decades with these various drugs and these vaccines i mean and i think there's no doubt about that so blindly trusting the medical authority in any sense in that regard to me is suicide now it's we've so changed our tune on so many Oh, we're a part of the things, problem. And we absolutely, uh, we are part of the problem. Oh, if you had diabetes, you, you take insulin, you know, you just have depression. Here's some Prozac. It was I mean, the same we're thing. a million take this miles for six from months there. to a year. Cause it'll rebalance everything. I mean, all that we were taught the same thing. It, it, the great, if I take pride in any of my medical expertise, it's that I actually had a big enough sack to change my mind, to actually see the evidence and to go, you know what? This part's right. You're right. Trauma. We do the best trauma surgery in the world in the United States. We do the worst primary care. It's, yeah. you know, two things in the same system can be opposites and they can both be true. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. And, and you know, I think back, we haven't even gone down this topic and maybe we should just leave this for another episode. But, you know, I think back to when, I, oh man, it was 2010 when the, my first patient that was trying to switch from being a female to a male and wanted me to go along with the, I don't know, whoever the specialist in Portland was giving hormones to, um, to help in her transition as the word is. Um, and I was like, this isn't right. What the heck are we doing to people? And now, I mean, I can only imagine what you deal with, with kids that are, I don't know how many come to you that are, stuck in this nether world of wanting to change their identity and cut off body parts and take injections because of what they're going through, not thinking they're in the right body or were born as the wrong sex and all this nonsense that we're, I mean, it, that's just the next step in all of this. Like we're talking about is now people believe that people well, that that's, that's medical the, professionals yeah. are, it's, it makes me sick and I'm embarrassed to be part of that community of, of professionals that are doing this to kids and then we have parents that think oh yeah it's okay this is best for my child because everybody else thinks it's best you know the american academy of pediatrics and the american uh, psychiatric association literally make me throw up in my mouth it's so completely irrationally nuts and to me they're political organizations clearly they are like I, i used to be in the you know aafp and they came out on some political rant about, I don't know, 2007 or 2008. And I just said, I will never, ever be a member ever again. I'm, I, I can't give my money to somebody that completely disagrees with every political yeah. value I have. Yeah. So, of course. so where do you go from here? Are you, <laughs> I was going to say, um, I want you to share with our audience to talk about your podcast, Radically Genuine. Does it give you some outlet, some hope for your profession instead of just pulling the plug and getting out and, you know, working at a surf shop <laughs> next yes. to be happy. Yeah. Like, <gasps> oh, I've thought about it. <laughs> uh, kidding, right? Yeah. Uh, I meet amazing people, right? So I'm only here talking to the two of you today because I decided to become outspoken, develop the radically genuine podcast. I also write a sub stack, but where I'm at right now is, and I don't know if you're aware of this is I, I started a, a nonprofit called the Conscious Clinician Collective. I mean, we're just Mm -hmm. two weeks in and we're just trying to fundraise it. But this is, um, you know, I've had so many conversations for, you know, with professionals, but also, you know, for the most part, parents, family members, and individuals in the system who are kind of reaching out, how can I find someone like you in my community, right? They they all seem to want to push drugs or, you know, in, in some situations they alienate kids from their families. And we have to be very open about, you know, how that possibility exists uh, in the mental health world and even with pediatricians that kids can get alienated from their parents based on this ideology. And so what does that mean? Well, you can go have a therapist who 
is going to help build this idea of gender ideology, right? I mean, it's an idea that has to be created in their minds. So if you have this impressionable young person and a, a therapist who who is ideologically captured and they feel like they are doing something that's really good for that kid, they can create that idea. Now, before you know it, you know, your parents are the, the enemy or anyone who questions any of this is, uh, you know, transphobic. And so there's not a lot of trust for mental health professionals and there's real genuine concern about the medical establishment. So I've met so many great people and I realized there's got to be way, some way for us to unite. So how are, how are people able to find an, an ethical and conscious, you know, clinician, healthcare practitioner? And the only way we can do it is if we can agree to some guiding principles. So if you go to the my website, it's uh, theccollective.org. There's a declaration on there. And read the declaration. It's very reasonable. And it's a lot about what we spoke about today. And it represents a lot of the concerns about the trajectory of, of where we're going as a society and the dangers that currently exist. We have to pull back. We have to unite. We have to resist. And so uh, if you can go to my website, we'll take any donation, join it, right? We're trying to create that platform where it's easy for people to be able to access uh, clinicians. The greater piece of this is where do you get accurate information, right? Uh, you know, the, the pharmaceutical aid, uh, industry and the medical establishment, you know, they own media, they own Google, you know, people get a lot of information from their first two you know, searches on, on, on Google, which is all distorted information. So whether it's from podcasts or, uh, or, or publishing studies or talking about informed consent, because really the, what this comes down to is you cannot, you cannot um, consent to any medical in, in, intervention or psychological intervention unless you're provided the information around its potential risks, its harms, and, you know, alternatives to this. And so we want to be able to empower people to be able to do their own research, but you have to trust there's an organization right. who's going to present it to you. So it's a large endeavor. And so I'm faced here with my first opportunity to try to fundraise for this so we can at least first build the platform and then have people join too. And so, you know, I'm really trying to push this, the Conscious Clinician Collective, the cccollective.org. Take a look at it. You know, if you align with it, every small bit of money helps to build this thing, like $25, right? This is a, um, this is a nonprofit organization that uh, will allow you to write this off on, uh, on, on your taxes. You know, we have uh, uh, that 5013C designation. So, um, you know, it's really important that we do something about it, right? We need to fight against what's happening. And this is my answer to this. And I, I feel like it's a calling for me to have to do. And I just have to get better at promoting it and building it and growing it. I'm doing so many different things. I'm still doing you know, direct clinical work. I'm running a practice. I'm writing every week. I'm doing a podcast. I'm going on podcasts. But hopefully, you know, opportunities like this can provide some exposure and we can spread the word. Everyone just tell three people about it. And that's how these things kind of spread. Wonderful. Absolutely. Um, I'm curious. How do you have other clinicians currently uh, on that list um, that have joined you already? You've created the list of where people can go and kind of who to look for. Just started, correct? so we're yep. yeah, we're yep. just started with. So we're just building. We have the platform's not available yet. Okay, so we're gather we're gathering the list, the list, but it's a yep. twenty thousand dollar investment just to do. Um, the website yeah. development, right, right, right. And so this is a process. And so, yeah, we have to, we have to raise the money and then we have to get people who are willing to join it. And I, I think that's kind of where I'm real dedicating a lot of my focus right now. Oh, good for you. I can think of a few people we've already had on the show that would probably be. It, well, it's like, and it's, a, it's a huge deal. That. It's a huge deal because I, I remember when I left, I, I did a little bit of primary care when before we left Oregon and I was like and people are like well who's going to take over where do I find somebody like you and I'm like uh I don't know yeah like I, I don't know I mean I can tell you who to look up online but I you know people need these resources and I mean even at where I where I work now I just do urgent care and I bump into people and like do you take patients and I'm like no I don't sorry just a shift worker <laughs> But, um, you know, because at this stage in my life, I don't really want to. People run are hungry practice. for this information. But they're hungry for find honest. People but, that are like minded. And it's like, well, where do I go? Like, I don't want to go see anybody in my city, even my state, depending where you live. And 
then they hear people on podcasts and interviewed and, but it's like, but are they taking patients? How do we even find information on where to go locally? So that's all needed. Absolutely. So thank you for doing that. And um, yeah, any way we can send some more people your way Absolutely. to connect with that, we would love to do that to help out. Yeah, I would appreciate any help and whether that's, you know, connections to be on other podcasts or, or just promoting the, the organization, we really need that kind of unification um, because the enemy around this is, is really, really strong, right? And it's, uh, it's going to take a, a lot of work from really ethical, compassionate, conscious people who care about the work that you're doing. I, I, can, I can tell that your work was a calling for you. This is a calling for me. This isn't a job. You know, this is some. This is part of my life mission. This is a purpose that I have, and uh, I I can't do it uh, unless I'm all in. I can't do it unless all my heart is in, and I and I follow. You know what my moral compass is is telling me to follow. Well, oh, that's great. Well, um, where can everybody find you? Uh, you do. I I think I found you on Instagram originally. So uh, yeah, I think you still have that. Yeah, we we started that approximately a year ago, and that's at Radically Genuine. You can follow me on, on Instagram. Um, my largest following is on Twitter X, and that's at Dr. McFillin. And I have this growing sub stack. It's free. I write a weekly uh, article. Um, information I think that's kept out of the mainstream often. And, you know, that's find me Dr. McFillin at, uh, on, on sub stack. Uh, I also title that Radically Genuine. Uh, Radically Genuine Podcast is in the top 1% of global downloads right now. It, it's growing because we have conversations just like this and people get a lot of information uh, that's outside of uh, what is standard, right? And uh, it it's, it's can be very validating for a lot of people who've been harmed within the, the mental health system in general. But just like the two of you, I mean, I'm interested in restoring health and well-being and spirituality and a life worth living. And I just like meeting interesting people. And having those conversations and, and people learn. Um, you can go to my website, drmcfillin.com. That's where you can sign up for a sub stack and you can download any of my episodes and get a sense of, uh, you know, the other podcasts that that I'll be on. Uh, you know, I try to post that on, on my website as well. Mm -hmm. Outstanding. Well, thank you so much for your time. This was great. As most of our guests, we've been so blessed. Like, as you said, talking to interesting people, we could literally talk for hours. But again, not Joe Rogan. I don't have a bag of weed. So, <laughs> my gosh. So, thanks again. Uh, if, if so, if, if possible, we'd love to have you back. Um, hang out for us with us just for a couple seconds when we hit pause here, just to make sure everything's buttoned up from a technical perspective. And again, thank you again, Dr. Roger McMillan. Thanks for having me. Well, that was a refreshing and really, I don't know, I won't say eye-opening, but exhilarating uh, interview. So much more things that we could have talked about, but it's so great to hear from a psychologist that shares a similar perspective as we do. I know we've had others on our show, but... If you can sense the theme here, there really is a bunch of um, like-minded clinicians in psychiatry, psychology, mental health that aren't kind of buying into the the new narrative that we've been hearing. So there is hope for families, people wanting. Um, no, no, to, this is the new narrative. The old narrative is the one that's. Bullshit. I love it. I love it. Um, Th this idea that you know you have no personal responsibility life is supposed to be good. It's you're supposed to be happy. The, the de facto state of humanity is happiness. And if you lack any of that, it's just because you're deficient in Prozac. Like, honestly, just think of that for a minute and think of how completely insane that is. You're born with a Prozac deficiency. Well, we bought into it and we that's did. why we're now it's called insane. BS free MD because we are <laughs> changing our tune and call them BS on so many of the things that we taught, believed, and did. And for that, we are humbled and really apologize for some of our ways. But hey, I'm trying to do better. And um, hey, Dr. McFillin, thank you so much for joining us today, taking all that time. Great conversation. For our listeners, if you want to learn more about his work, check out his Substack. Um, you find them on substack.com at Dr. McFillin. That's M-C-F-I-L-L-I. -L -L 
I N. Uh, listen to the Radically Genuine podcast. And if you're curious about his uh, new nonprofit and want to follow that as it comes up, um, remember that it is the um, Conscious Clinician Collective. It's just a starting. Um, so the website's fresh, young, and donate to that if you're um, wanting to support it and looking for like-minded uh, clinicians in that field. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. I haven't asked that in a long time, but your reviews really do help us reach more people and bump up our podcast to the top of the platform, which gets us more downloads, more followers and listeners, which are sponsors look at and used to help our show along as they give us some money to keep this thing going. So it helps bring you more amazing content. And thanks for tuning in as always. Until next time, stay healthy and informed. All right, community shout out. Hey, Mike Cruz, we noticed you popping into Docktails here and there. So we wanted to be sure to know how much we appreciate that. Thanks for listening and your support, friend. We will see you around. It's no secret that medicine is a bit um, uptight. That's why Tim and I created BS Free MD to mix things up a little and have fun in the process. Besides, we are having these exact same discussions all the time, so we thought we might as well invite everyone to the party. If you really like us, you can get plenty more and maybe see one of Tim's cool tattoos on our Instagram or Facebook pages at BS Free MD. See you next time. But we try to keep BS Free MD as raw and real as possible. We can't be held responsible for any medical decisions or discussions had as a result of what you've heard on the show. We know, bummer. But the truth is, we really do care about your questions. So feel free to reach out to us by email at doc at bsfreemd.com.